Okay, I think it's time to get started. Uh, welcome everybody to the second of uh, this uh, sessions of Community Medical School. My name is uh, Mark Greenblatt. I'm an associate professor of medicine in the uh, hematology oncology unit here at UVM and Fletcher Allen, and a, a longtime member of the uh, committee for uh, Community Medical School. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you and to welcome tonight's speaker, um, Deborah Leonard, who is our new chief of pathology. Uh, for UVM and Fletcher Allen. Uh, Dr. Leonard um, has an MD and a PhD from NYU and has been at three excellent academic centers in her career over the last 25 years where she really got in on the ground floor of one of the, the great scientific revolutions of all time, which is the, the um, genetics revolution um, for which the technology has been advancing uh, in spectacular fashion over the last 10 or 15 years, and she's been a big part of that. Um, she arrived here from uh, Cornell University where she is a molecular pathologist and is now directing our pathology uh, unit towards the future of uh, genetics. Her talk tonight is going to be less, uh, less technical and more legal, some of the social implications of the big genetic uh, advances. And um, you can see the topic in front of you, who owns your genes? How the patent system impacts physicians and patients. And it's been an interesting and continually evolving story that's very interesting. Thanks, Mark. It's a real, a real pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to be talking with you about um, events that have happened to me over the last 17 years in my practice of molecular pathology. Um, so we'll talk about patents and human gene patents and how those came about. And then the impact of gene patents on medical practice. We'll talk a little bit about why we should care that there are gene patents. And then progress towards solutions, which I guess that tells you which side of the fence I'm on, that I really wish there weren't gene patents. So Patents were established by the U.S. Constitution, so way back a long time ago. Um, the U.S. Constitution grants the right to exclude others for a limited time from making, using, or selling an invention. And there are certain requirements for something to be an invention and patent eligible. And there are three main parts to this code, and they're called 101, 102, and 103. So 101 says that an invention has to be new, made by man, and not a product of nature. The second part, 102, says that it has to be novel. So it has, it has to be different from anything else. And 103 says it's not obvious. Um, so that means, basically, there's something called prior art. And if someone trained in the prior art of whatever your invention is, is in could have done the same thing, then it's also not patentable. So the purpose of patents, I mean, why have patents? Um, our forefathers thought that it, was, it would help promote the progress of science and useful arts. So rather than keeping something secret because you were afraid that someone else would steal it or practice it, they thought it would provide an incentive to invent and to disclose those inventions. Um, and also, eventually uh, provide incentive and protection for the commercialization of those inventions without fear of it being stolen out from under you, if you will. So how did we get from the patent rights that are granted by the Constitution to the patenting of human gene sequences? So I like to acknowledge a colleague of mine, Roger Klein, who has both an MD and a JD. Um, he's a lawyer also, as a, in addition to being a physician, and he has, um, educated me a great deal on the history of how we, we got here. So in the 1970s, there was very high unemployment rates um, and high inflation, rising oil prices, and shaken U.S. confidence. Sounds a little familiar I mean, to, to today. But um, there was also, different from today, a real drastic increase in the funding for biomedical research. And so the NIH funding was going through the ceiling, but what NIH realized was that they weren't, they didn't seem to be getting a lot of commercial development, a lot of products, a lot of new companies um, developing out of all this funding. 
And so the Bayh-Dole Act was instituted because there were about 28,000 patents that had been funded um, by NIH or other government institutions, but they were held by the US government at that time. And less than 5% of these were licensed to companies for development. And so this is what Bayh-Dole was to address. So Birch Bayh and Bob Dole were the two um, sponsors of this act. And basically what this act did was allow nonprofits like academic institutions and small businesses um, to retain their own patents if they had been funded by the federal government. So instead of having to turn them over to the federal government, they could keep them and develop them themselves. So universities actually were encouraged to license the patents that had been developed by their faculty um, to businesses and actually develop products. And so the patenting after by Dole by universities went up drastically. And the impact was not only an increase in the patenting, but an increase in the licensing of those patents for development, commercial development. So more than 2,200 companies were founded and 1,000 new products were developed, um, 250,000 jobs or more, $30 billion annually. But there was a real shift in academia from an emphasis on scientific rewards, there's the term publish or perish, um, and doing scientific research to help people to universities understanding that if their faculty uh, made new discoveries and patented those and they licensed them, they could make a windfall in extra income to the university that they before didn't have. So it really was an interesting shift that we still function under today from the scientific rewards of being nationally or internationally recognized for your work published in, in uh, uh, significant journals to um, a drive from the university to help with their bottom line from the money that would come to academia. So shifting gears a little bit, um, there was a landmark case that basically now, you have to understand, I'm not a lawyer, so if any of you are lawyers out there, um, this is a physician's understanding of law. Um, so there was a landmark case, Diamond versus Chakrabarty, um, and Anand Chakrabarty was a scientist in the research and development group working for General Electric in 1971 when he created a new genetically engineered pseudomonas that could digest oil. So when there were oil spills, this pseudomonas could be introduced into the oil spill and it would help digest the oil and resolve uh, the oil spill in addition to the uh, dramatic mechanical cleanup of the oil. So General Electric and Chakrabarty thought that this should be patentable. And so the original patent that was filed for this genetically engineered organism was denied because the court the lower court thought that living things should not be patentable. So the decision was appealed um, to the US Patent and Trademark Office Board of Appeals um, and they denied also. So it was taken to the Supreme Court in 1980. And it was a 5-4 decision, so it was a split decision from the Supreme Court but in favor of granting Chakrabarty this, this uh, patent on this genetically engineered uh, pseudomonas organism, which is not found in nature, was made by man. But it opened the door for a lot of patenting of living things. So there was a Harvard mouse that was patented that had been, we now call them knockout mice, but they, they are fairly routine at this point. Um, leukemia derived cell lines, stem cells, and human gene sequences began to be patented. So how could you patent a human gene sequence, well, there were precedents for patenting things that were found in nature, but you had isolated them. And so epinephrine, vitamin B12, when they are isolated, they actually could be patented. So what they were allowing for human gene sequences was the patenting of isolated and purified uh, gene sequences. So they were being treated as chemical substances and consideration of the information encoded by genes was not really being taken into account. 
And the extent of human patenting that had happened by around 2005, 2006 was about 20% of all human genes were covered by one or more patents. And about half of the known cancer genes at the time had been patented. And one company, Insight, held patents on about 10% of all human genes. So this was not a trivial one or two genes have been patented kind of problem. And this is the extent. It, it's a wide range of disease gene patents that have been patented. Breast cancer, hemochromatosis, um, Alzheimer disease, colorectal cancer. There's a, there's a wide range of genes affecting many different kinds of diseases. So what is claimed in a human gene patent? It's, it's a wide variety of things. They, they can claim or patent the gene or the cDNA sequence. So a gene makes a messenger RNA, and that messenger RNA is what is used to make the protein inside of a cell. And so the messenger RNA in the laboratory can actually be reverse copied back into a DNA molecule, and that's called a complementary DNA or cDNA. So genes and cDNA sequences are patented. Mutations that have been found in genes have been patented. All methods that they could possibly think of and any that, you know, they'd have these random statements in there and any other way of looking at the gene was patented. And also the correlation of a gene mutation with a disease onset or risk could also be patented. So all these kinds of things were patented so that one individual or a company then owned that medically significant information. And it's clear, it's not clear in these cases what's actually been made by man. There's been a discovery process for sure, um, but even the Supreme Court says even if something is difficult to do, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily patent eligible. But what these do is permit monopolization of uh, medical information. So that's how we kind of got to having gene patents around. Um, so how have gene patents affected medical practice? And I'm going to start out by talking about how they've affected my medical practice. So I'm a molecular pathologist. I have medical training. Um, in pathology, and I have a PhD in molecular biology, which is um, kind of the science of uh, genes and DNA and RNA and genetic material. I specialize in the use, performance, and interpretation of clinical tests that are based on patients' genetic material, either DNA or RNA. I also look at the scientific discoveries that are being made and translate new scientific discoveries into new clinical tests. So molecular pathology tests are important for patient care in infectious diseases because germs that infect us have their own genomes that are different from us, and we can do testing to identify those pathogens. Um, for genetic or inherited diseases, so basically anything that someone, that a doctor would take a family history for, we can do sometimes do testing for. Um, also for cancers, because cancers develop because their genetic material has gone awry and the, the tumor cells either grow too quickly or don't die like the normal cells so that you accumulate cancer cells. So in all these areas, we can do medical testing. And this is my medical practice as a physician. People think that this is my research, but it is, I, there are research things that come out of this, but this is for patient care. So I received my first gene patent enforcement letter in 1997 when I was at the University of Pennsylvania. And it was from a company called Athena Diagnostics, so it was in March of 1997. And Athena Diagnostics didn't have the patent, but they had acquired exclusive rights to the patent from a patent holder. And many of the companies who do this kind of exclusive rights, getting exclusive rights, are getting those rights from academic institutions. Because remember, that's where most of the discoveries are made. And they had the exclusive rights to a patent that was important for Alzheimer disease risk. And by testing for a particular form of the APOE gene called APOE4, it predicted an increased risk for Alzheimer disease. And 
they were telling me, I was doing this testing in my laboratory, my clinical laboratory at the time, um, that I could only continue doing this test by sending the specimens to Athena Diagnostics to have the testing done. And they were charging $195 per specimen. At the time, we were charging $100.50 for the test. So some of the problems illustrated by this um, enforcement is that a, an exclusive licensee can be a sole test provider in the United States if they have the patent or exclusive rights to the patent. And they can charge whatever price they want because there is no competition. And in the current healthcare um, reform environment and the high cost of healthcare, this is probably questionable. My second letter came about a year later in June 1998 from SmithKline Beecham Healthcare Services, and they had a patent related to hemochromatosis. Hemochromatosis is an iron storage disease where you accumulate too much iron in your body, and it can destroy many of your organs, um, your heart, pancreas, other organs, but it's treatable because if you simply donate blood frequently, you use up your excess iron stores, and so it is a treatable disease. And there were several patents that covered this uh, disease, and they had been licensed exclusively by SmithKline Beecham Clinical Laboratories. So we were asked to contact SmithKline Beecham Clinical Laboratories to make what are called necessary arrangements. <clears throat> so these necessary arrangements consisted of a $25,000 upfront fee and then a fee per test that we would perform. Interestingly, if the University of Pennsylvania had any intellectual property that SmithKline Beecham was interested in licensing, they might uh, exchange intellectual property rights for this upfront fee that they wanted me to pay. And believe me, when I went to my vice chair and said, they want $25,000, um, I couldn't stop him from laughing because um, in molecular pathology, we generally don't make a whole lot of money. In fact, we barely break even. So this was not going to happen. So here, it was an unreasonable licensing fee. They were providing licenses, so they weren't a sole provider. So back to Athena Diagnostics. I got really familiar with them. In 1998, I received another letter from Athena Diagnostics, another patent related to a disease called spinocerebellar ataxia type 1. Um, spinocerebellar ataxias are a group of genetic diseases that are movement disorders, and they're caused by mutations in a lot of different genes. So this is one of the genes, and Athena had, again, exclusively licensed the patent for the gene SCA1, and it was only by using Athena Diagnostics laboratories that we could do this testing. Well, in my laboratory, we had been testing for a number of SCA-related genes. So now, instead of being able to test for SCA1, 2, 3, 6, and 7, and there are now 29 of these genes, um, these are the most prevalent, I could not test for SCA1 anymore. So guess what? If I wasn't testing for SCA1, I wasn't going to be testing for SCA2, 3, 6, or 7, because if you can't test for the most common one, you're not going to get the testing for the others. So the exclusive licensee, again, was enforcing them, their rights as a sole test provider. But this illustrates that if you control one gene that's necessary for a panel, you basically can control that entire panel. This was a letter I received in 1999 from Miami Children's Hospital. You're beginning to see a pattern here. This was a very bad time for me. I was beginning to think that I should have gone to law school, and I was spending more time with the patent lawyers than I was uh, anyway, um, Miami Children's Hospital uh, Research Institute um, had discovered the gene for Canavan disease, which is a, a metabolic disease where you accumulate, um, there's a, an enzyme deficiency and you accumulate a factor that basically prevents myelin production. And myelin is the sheath that, that covers the nerves and allows them to do electrical conduction. So without the myelin, the nervous system didn't work right in kids who had this disease. And there was a patent that they held, and um, they wanted a flat rate of $12.50 per test. Not so bad. But they wanted to set volume limitations. So they wanted to say that after I had done 25 or 50 or 100 tests, some amount 
when I hit that during the year, then I couldn't do any more tests in my laboratory. Doesn't really make sense for a clinical laboratory. And in addition, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommended Canavan screening for all Jewish women of childbearing age. And it was part of a Jewish genetic panel, <coughs> along with Neiman Pick and, and other prominent genetic diseases in individuals with a Jewish genetic uh, ethnic background. And so again, by taking Canavan disease out of this panel, you basically would not be doing a Jewish genetic panel. So there were unreasonable licensing conditions, and again, one gene controlling many, testing for many genes. Now this is a case, I didn't receive this letter, but there was another genetics laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania at the time in the Department of Medical Genetics. And Myriad Genetics um, was enforcing their BRCA1 patent. So BRCA1 mutations increase an individual's risk of actually breast and ovarian cancer and several other cancer types in both men and women. Myriad Genetics was the patent holder, is the patent holder, and they were giving limited licenses to selected laboratories for only certain common mutations, but they were the only laboratory that could do complete sequencing or complete analysis of the entire BRCA1 gene, which is really for breast cancer risk assessment what is needed because the mutations are kind of all over this gene. And so there's a second gene that was discovered, BRCA2, and if you can't do BRCA1 testing, it also captures BRCA2 testing. So Dr. Arupa Gangli was the director um, of the laboratory doing this testing, and she had to stop doing clinical BRCA1 testing in 1999 because of this enforcement from Myriad Genetics. So again, you have a sole provider of a test across the entire United States, one gene controlling testing for other genes, and I know from uh, what you'll learn later that Myriad was charging a very un unreasonable rate of about $6,000 at the time. Arupa was charging about $2,500. So then in 1999, I received a letter. Um, I didn't put all these letters in your handout, so I apologize if you're leafing through trying to find them. It's just the print would have been so small by the time they got on that little slide that you wouldn't have seen anything. Um, so I saved a few trees. Um, so I got a letter in 1999 from the University of Michigan, and this was for the most common mutation, Delta F508, that causes cystic fibrosis. And they held the patent to the Delta F508 gene, and they were, or mutation in the CFTR gene, which is the cystic fibrosis gene, and they were offering non-exclusive worldwide in-house diagnostic testing licenses. If your test did not make money, which was almost standard for molecular pathology tests, or if you were using a test that the test provider, the test kit maker, had a license from University of Michigan, then there was no license needed and you didn't have to pay any fee. So you may be saying, so why am I showing this one? Well, this is not a problem. If everyone who was enforcing their patents were providing non-exclusive licensing at reasonable licensing fees and conditions, then I probably would not be standing here giving you this talk because there wouldn't really be a problem. So this is another, I don't have the copy of this letter for some reason, but I do have um, a license agreement um, that was sent to me from a company called InVivoScribe Technologies um, and what they had were um, licenses to two patents that were held by someone else, and that method was used for diagnosis and monitoring of leukemias and lymphomas, which are blood cancers. So in vivo Scribe was selling test kits to clinical laboratories to use for their testing for both the diagnosis of leukemias and lymphomas and for monitoring of residual disease as leukemia lymphoma patients would be treated. This method had actually been in clinical practice since 1990, but the patents hadn't issued, and so basically the patent holder forced in vivo scribe to take an exclusive license from the patent holder, or they would have had to shut down their company, 
and the clinical labs were required to obtain then a license from in vivo scribe. And the conditions of that license was they didn't make you pay for any previous testing that you had, had done. So the Canavan actually did make you pay for previous tests done that were not done under a license. I forgot to mention that part. And there was a licensing fee to even start doing this. You had to pay a licensing fee in tens of thousands of dollars. And I heard a range of amounts from different um, laboratories. And then you had to pay a per test fee that was zero if you were using their test kits, up to $60 if you were not using their test kits. So in 2002, in my laboratory, we were doing around 200 of two different kinds of this test. The cost to perform each test without the license and everything was about $300. And their fee was going to be $40 to $60 per test, which was about 15 to 22% of the cost of the test. So it significantly increased the cost for us. And there was a yearly amount. The kicker is Medicare reimbursed $55.39. So you can see how molecular pathology really was not making too much money. So um, the problem here was an unreasonable licensing fee or conditions. So, while I was at the University of Pennsylvania, I had to stop doing testing for four different disease genes, CMT1A, Charcot-Marie Tooth, type 1A, the BRCA, not me, but B Medical Genetics Laboratory, APOE used for Alzheimer disease and Canavan disease. I negotiated agreements easily for cystic fibrosis and then for the in vivo scribe leukemia lymphoma testing. We did take a license to that. I had received notification letters for hemochromatosis and spinocerebellar ataxia, but they were just never followed through. So sometimes if you just ignore them, on some of those letters you might have seen that some of them said second notification letter. Um, so if you just ignored them, but sometimes my lawyers wouldn't let, the, let me ignore them. And I was aware that there was the potential for patent enforcement from other genes that we were doing testing for in the clinical laboratory, namely spinal muscular atrophy, myotonic dystrophy, and others. So what these letters illustrate is that patentees and exclusive licensees of human gene patents can enforce unreasonable licensing conditions within the healthcare environment. They can charge very high fees for tests with low reimbursement. There are limitations on the test volumes that they can set any kind of conditions that they want. Um, payment. If you're doing testing for a gene panel, if every single gene has a license, then you would have to get multiple licenses in order to do a gene panel uh, test. And they can limit the use of methods. Um, they can specify how testing is done if they're the sole providers. So control of one gene can control entire disease testing for a particular disease. And they can be allowed to be a sole provider of a clinical service in the United States. So remember, I got my first letter in 1997. University of Pennsylvania had a very strong bioethics group. And they were fascinated when I started telling them about this issue of human gene patents. So in 1998, we did a, a small pilot survey of 74 laboratory directors to see whether everybody else was having the same experience I was having. And about 50% of the directors said that they hadn't offered a genetic test or developed it because it's a lot of work to develop and validate and implement one of these tests in a clinical laboratory setting. And if you know you're going to have to be stopped anyway, you just don't do it. And 25% reported having been stopped doing a test that they were already doing because of patent enforcement. So we thought this was an extensive enough problem, and we decided to study it further. So we moved forward in 1999 looking at the hemochromatosis enforcement. Um, by Smith Klein Beecham Clinical Laboratories. And we, looked, we surveyed 128 uh, labs and did 117 interviews. 30% reported not adopting or dropping the test. And 22 of the labs stated patents were the reason that they stopped doing the test and, uh, or n weren't doing the test. And 10 labs stated the patent was one of several reasons. And what this timeline illustrates is Patents are filed at a certain point in time when the discoveries are made. And so there was a series of patents related to hemochromatosis shown in these green lines, 95 to 96, the patent applications were filed. 
The paper was submitted in 1996 and then released in August of 1996. So this is when the scientific and medical community then knows about this gene and its relationship to hemochromatosis. So this red line shows the number of laboratories that are adopting this test. And you can see that as soon as it's published practically, there's already one or two labs doing the testing because it's fairly straightforward to translate molecular biology scientific discoveries into a clinical laboratory when it's for diagnostic purposes. And this is the number of labs, and we completed our survey here. The patents were issued here in 1998, and I got my enforcement letter soon after that. So you can see that patent incentives are not needed for clinical laboratories to start doing this testing. And remember, development of a discovery into a useful tool is one of the reasons for the patent system. So it's questionable whether that incentive is really needed for development of genetic information into clinical use. So that's basically the point that's made here. And the patent holder basically wants the patent issues, which is delayed from when the, the applications happen, the medical market has been developed, and they can step right into that and enforce and have the medical market already developed for them. So then we looked more broadly at a broad range of genetic tests. So we did a survey of 211 labs from a number of sources, and we got responses from 121 laboratories that were performing clinical genetic testing. Um, and basically, 65% of them reported having been contacted by a patent or license owner. 53 reported that they did not develop a clinical test due to awareness of the patent, and 25% stopped performing a genetic test. And the extent of this, since this isn't just one disease that we're looking at, there were 12 genetic tests covered by 22 patents that were reported as um, being included in this, and each test was performed by one to nine laboratories. So these three studies show that about 30 to 50 percent of laboratories are not doing testing because of fear of patents or concerns about patents. I don't know if fear is the right word. And 20 to 25 percent have stopped doing testing um, because of patent enforcements. So in my mind, gene patents constrain medical practice. They eliminate competition for test pricing. They reduce innovation in testing methods so that if one laboratory is doing a test, they do it by whatever method they want, and they don't have to modernize that test as technologies change that we have access to. They can actually dictate medical practice because they can say who can get the test, who can't get the test, and how the testing will be done. Um, they limit patient access, and I'll show you a study that demonstrates that. They limit clinical scientific observations because when there is one laboratory doing this testing, you lose the breadth of making observations with the clinical testing because whenever we're doing clinical testing, we're learning new things about the disease, about how the test works. So it slows new discovery, it limits medical education because my residents and fellows weren't doing certain kinds of testing because they could only be done at one location. And they prevent our advance to genomic medicine, which is one of the projects that I'm doing here is developing a genomic medicine program at Fletcher Allen. So, so why should we care? Well, classic medical genetics, the diseases are caused entirely by duplication or deletion of an entire chromosome, like in Down syndrome, um, or an alteration of the sequence of a single gene, as is the case for cystic fibrosis, Huntington disease, spinal muscular atrophy, and a lot of other classic medical genetic diseases. Classic medical genetics focuses on diseases due to mutations in one gene that are inherited, so passed down from parent to child. It's very, very important to the families and individuals who are affected by these diseases, but these conditions tend to be very rare. They're a relatively small part of medical practice. Medical genetics is not one of the most um, common subspecialties, and it has minimal impact on overall, on the overall patient and population. But if you look at the leading causes of death in the United States, heart disease, cancer, chronic disease, 
Alzheimer disease, diabetes, all of these are influenced by genetics. And you'll notice I skipped accidents. But if you think about risk-taking behavior, uh, drug addiction, which is also influenced and can affect accidents, basically all of these are influenced um, by genetics. So if you think about Jim Fix, he was 5'10", 150 pounds, and a marathon runner, and he promoted a healthy lifestyle, wrote books. He died at age 52 of a heart attack. His father had died at age 43 of a heart attack. Compare to Winston Churchill, 5'8", 270 pounds. He didn't exercise, at least not that anybody observed. He smoked and had basically what everyone would consider an unhealthy lifestyle and died at age 90. So this is the impact of genetics and our genetic makeup and how it impacts our overall health. So we are moving now to an era of what I will call genomic medicine, which means that we can analyze very large parts of individual patients' genetic material or genome. Um, and those, we can use those genomic variants that affect the risk for common diseases in medical care for individual patients with the testing results used for diagnosis of disease, choosing the right treatment, for disease monitoring, pharmacogenetics, so what does that mean? We all take drugs and many of those drugs have genetic information in the label that says that someone with a particular genetic makeup could have a severe adverse reaction or might not respond to the usual dosing, might need a higher dose or a lower dose. And, and that can be used to better tailor the, the drugs that we prescribe for patients. It can be used for prognosis, disease prevention, if, if we can know that someone is at high risk for a particular disease, we may be able to develop uh, preventive strategies, and it's used for prenatal diagnosis. And genomic medicine basically affects virtually every person and will affect virtually every physician's medical practice. And gene patents limit this future because they limit the parts of the genome that we're allowed to look at. Um, I won't go over all of these because we've kind of talked about it, but I have said over and over again that a sole provider of a medical service isn't in the best interest of the public health. So what could be done to solve what I consider to be a pretty significant problem? One option is to do nothing, and believe me, many people in biotechnology um, think that the gene patents are fine, and it is okay to have a sole provider of a medical service. I disagree with that, so we'll just cross that one off the list. Um, so one of, one of the options is a policy approach, and there have been three major national studies um, done. NIH um, basically developed guidelines when it became aware of this issue. Um, I talked with Francis Collins and in front of committees about this issue and the impact on clinical testing. They, NIH basically developed guidelines that recommended limiting patenting as much as possible and to not do exclusive licensing unless there was some reason to do that, but to do broad licensing and um, potentially to not enforce the patents. But these were just guidelines and so they had no teeth. Um, people could do it and I think it actually did have an impact on a lot of the technology transfer people who were doing licensing in academic institutions because some of the most egregious cases were academic institutions licensing exclusively to a company and not understanding the impact they were having on medical practice. The National Academies did a study at the request of Francis Collins, who was head at the time of the National Human Genome Research Institute. And he asked them to look at the research and clinical impact of gene patents. They ended up, because of the composition of the committee and because of the volume of information they had to look at, they had a very researched focus to their report. And there was only one clinical recommendation, which I found out from someone on the committee, even that one recommendation was highly controversial, that um, it would be good to be able to allow second opinion testing. Now, in a clinical setting, in my laboratory, if the only kind of testing I could do was second opinion testing, once or twice a year, I couldn't remain proficient at that testing and it would be really 
uh, not a, a good quality thing to let me do second opinion testing. So that recommendation really does not make clinical sense. And then the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Genetics, Health, and Society decided to look at the impact of gene patents and patient access to testing in 2010. I had been on the committee from 2006 to 2009 and advocated for this, but because in 2006 the National Academies were doing their study, the Secretary's Advisory Committee waited to do their analysis to see what the National Academies, and we worked on other issues, but I got to actually stay on to this committee working on um, the Gene Patents and Patient Access Task Force. Um, it was chaired by Jim Evans from UNC Chapel Hill, and we took multiple approaches to investigate the clinical impact of gene patents. Um, we commissioned in-depth research studies of cases, different gene disease cases, and comparisons out of Duke University. There was a public comment process, and we even looked at international perspectives on this. And there was a comprehensive report to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Michael Levitt, at the time um, in 2010. So this was the first national study that documented a negative impact of gene patents on patient access and medical practice. And some of the recommendations included patent exemption, so that you for diagnostic and research uses, um, federal monitoring of patient access problems, federal promotion of broad licensing and patient access, and enhanced transparency in patents and licensing because it's very hard, even as a clinical laboratory, I didn't go to medical school to become a patent lawyer, so it's very hard to know even how to look that there are patents and usually academic lawyers have um, other things to do. So, the policy approaches, while there have been some, have not been very effective. So the other approach is Congress. So um, I forget when this was done, but uh, I'm sorry that there are also these eyeballs staring at you, but it gets your attention. So a surgeon, a cataract surgeon, um, discovered that if you made a curved incision in the eyeball in order to take out the cataract, the lens that had darkened or gotten cloudy, and sewed it back up, it healed much better than a straight line incision. And so this surgeon had patented this procedure and was actually trying to enforce this patent against other surgeons. Well, the AMA was not happy about this and lobbied Congress for physician protection um, against uh, patents on medical procedures. So, so this is the Gansky-Frist Amendment that was passed in 1996. And basically, the amendment says medical procedures on a human body are patentable. So physicians can patent what they do, but they just can't enforce them against other physicians. So physicians can use those, that patented information without infringing the patent. And so the human body part is the important part here. It's, it excludes protection. It, the bio, the biotechnology industry organization basically made sure that Pathologists who are physicians who perform clinical tests are not covered by Gansky Frist. So, physicians like me who provide clinical testing services, their medical practice aren't protected under Gansky Frist. So, one possibility is to extend Gansky Frist to include exemption for physicians who perform molecular tests. And Lynn Rivers actually introduced a bill. Um, in uh, 1996 to extend Gansky Frisk, Frist, and I, that's when I started learning about politics. And um, basically, it was introduced by Representative Rivers, and she was not reelected due to redistricting of her um, region in her state. You guys don't have to worry about that, because the whole state of Vermont only has one representative, right? So, but anyway, the bill was never um, reintroduced. Another legislative option that has been explored is to mandate broad and reasonable licensing. So if everything was done the way University of Michigan was doing it, we wouldn't really have a problem. But basically, no such bills have been drafted to date. A third legislative option is just to prohibit gene patents legislatively. And in fact, there has been a bill hanging around for quite a while introduced um, by uh, Mr. Becerra and Mr. Weldon from Florida. And the bill is really short. I can show you on two slides. A bill to prohibit the patenting of human genetic material. And this is the second page, and this is the end. You usually don't find bills like this in Congress. 
But one of the issues is no patent may be obtained for a nucleotide sequence or its function or correlations or the naturally occurring products it specifies. So that's great. Except that remember how many gene patents I said already existed? This will not apply to patents issued before the date of the enactment of the bill. So it wouldn't fix all those old ones. So, and plus that, this is pretty drastic and doesn't allow for a lot of discussion and so it's never moved forward. So the congressional legislative options haven't exactly been too successful. So now let's move on to option four, which is the courts. And what I will tell you about is a history um, of cases in the court, because one of the approaches is to set case law as a precedent. And so there was a case, not so much related to gene patents, but a little bit. A family, the Greenberg family, had kids with Canavan disease. And remember I said I got a letter from Miami Children's Hospital Research Institute. Well, the Greenbergs actually organized other families with Canavan disease and contributed the DNA samples, the blood samples from all sorts of family members related so that Miami Children's Hospital Research Institute could do the research to identify the gene that causes Canavan disease, ASPA gene. And Miami Children's Hospital Research Institute, without knowledge of the families, patented the ASPA gene and its association with Canavan disease and started enforcing against laboratories. The Greenbergs brought a suit because Miami Children's Hospital Research Institute was basically limiting testing and the reason they had worked with this research group was so that testing could be widely available. In fact, prenatal testing or preconception testing can be offered to families. And so no one quite knows what happened because it was settled out of court in 2003 and of course in those settlement clauses are you are not allowed to say anything about the conditions of the settlement. The Greenbergs were represented by a lawyer named Lori Andrews, and she became absolutely outraged by the idea that human gene sequences could be patented. And this became almost her personal vendetta, almost more than mine. So Lori Andrews was connected with the American Civil Liberties Union, and she went and brought this gene pat patent issue to the ACLU and meetings were held in New York at the ACLU office. I went down and met with them to describe what the issues were and the ACLU actually chose to develop a case that would set precedent against gene patents and they picked the BRCA1 and 2 gene patents because they thought they, those, that enforcement by Myriad as the sole provider for something so significant to so many women, breast cancer, even men with breast cancer and ovarian, men, uh, women have ovarian cancer, there are other kinds of cancers caused by mutations in these genes, that it would clearly demonstrate the problems of gene patents. So we've talked about this, that mutations in BRCA1 and 2 are related to risk of breast and ovarian cancer and other kinds of cancers in men and women. Um, that Myriad is, that holds the patents for both of these genes, um, for the sequences, mutations in those genes, and the correlation of those mutations with cancer risk. And Myriad has strongly enforced it's being the sole provider for BRCA1 and 2 testing in the United States. They actually tried to enforce in Europe and Canada, but the European and Canadian governments said no and basically wouldn't allow Myriad to enforce there. And so testing is widely available in, Euro in Europe and Canada. So the ACLU filed their case May 12, 2009 in the United States District Court of Southern District of New York. And the case was called the Association for Molecular Pathology et al. Those were the plaintiffs. And the US Patent and Trademark Office et al. were the defendants. So the plaintiffs were actually four different medical organizations. I'm members of, a member of two of those organizations. Six doctors, two genetic counselors, five patients, one of which couldn't get a second opinion test and was having to decide about having a mastectomy and bilateral you know, ovaries removed without being able to confirm this test by another laboratory. Um, and other patients who weren't able to afford the testing uh, from Myriad. And then two uh, breast cancer, well, breast cancer action organization, and then the, it's actually, I don't know what this is called. I call it Our Bodies Ourselves because I grew up with that book. Um, but it's the collective that publishes this book. 
And the defendants were actually the US Patent and Trademark Office, which was, I was surprised about that, but it is the American Civil Liberties Union, and they were going, um, they were trying to say that gene patents were against your First Amendment rights. Myriad Genetics, and then the patent was derived from the University of Utah Research Foundation, and so the 10 directors of that uh, research foundation were named. Myriad is located in, in Utah. So this AMP, Association for Molecular Pathology versus USPTO. Um, I actually was one of the founders of the Association for Molecular Pathology back in 1992, so it's so cool that we have AMP, this little organization, standing up to the Patent and Trademark Office and Myriad Genetics. So the position that was being argued is that the patent claims are unconstitutional because gene sequences are actually products of nature and the gene disease correlations are products of nature. And so they were bringing certain claims from these patents, from a, a number of patents that claimed the BRCA1 and 2 gene and cDNA sequences, mutations that are found in these genes that are related to disease risk, comparing forms of the gene. So they had actually patented that if you have the normal sequence and you've sequenced a patient and you simply look at that, do that comparison, that's patented. And the correlation of that mutation in a patient with increased risk of a breast or ovarian cancer. So all these patent claims were being challenged in this trial. So the, file, the case was filed in May. In August, the plaintiffs, so AMP and everybody else, moved for summary judgment, which meant a court decision without a trial because they thought it was so obvious that gene sequences shouldn't be patented that they didn't need a trial. Well, the defendants moved to dismiss the whole case so on November 1st, the court in New York ruled on the motion to dismiss, and basically Judge Sweet said that the defendant's motion to dismiss the complaint is denied, and it is so ordered. So they went ahead with the trial, and the court issued its decision in March um, of 2010. And in the, the decision publication, one of the things that was stated is the plaintiff's challenge to the validity of these claims and the arguments presented by the parties have presented a unique and challenging question. Are isolated human genes and the comparison of their sequences patentable? So it had really come down to can you patent human gene sequences? And it was a very long decision, but basically Judge Sweet said that the final sentence says, the claims in suit, which is all the claims that were brought, are declared invalid because of 101. Now remember, 101 is the product of nature requirement. It, you can't patent something that's a product of nature. It has to be made by man. So that was the part of the patent law that they were using to say that these patents should be invalidated. So the gene patents the disease gene associations, and the methods claims were all declared not patentable, and boy, were we happy. Except then we talked to the ACLU and said, just wait, there'll be appeals. And so, June 2010, Myriad appeals. So we've gone through a series of appeals. So Myriad appealed to the US Court of Appeals of the Federal Circuit, um, and the appeals court issued their decision from the Federal Circuit. And basically, they said they reverse the court's decision that the myriad composition claims, so the gene patent claims, basically, they said, can be patented. So they overturned the previous court on whether gene sequences could be patented. They, they basically agreed with the other two parts. So basically, the genes were patentable now. But the disease gene associations and the methods remain not patentable after this case. So then in September 2011, the plaintiffs, again, that's the people who want to get rid of the gene patents, filed what's called a writ of cert certiorari. And I've learned that lawyers just call this filing a cert because they can't pronounce that word either. <laughs> so they pronounced that with the, they filed that with the Supreme Court. And what that does is basically ask the Supreme Court to look at what's been decided in the lower court and say that it was done okay, and the whole process was fine, or there was a problem with it. And so March 27th, 
the Supreme Court actually granted cert and sent the case back to the Federal Circuit to look at it again because the Supreme Court had just decided in March also another, another case, which was Mayo versus Prometheus. So the Mayo versus Prometheus case was around the correlation of a certain metabolite level in the blood with predicting drug activity or side effects of the drug. So Prometheus sued Mayo for infringing that patent because Mayo started using another method than what was in the patent and not paying Prometheus anymore. So in the lower courts, Mayo won. You can see a pattern here. And the court decided that it was unpatentable natural law. Court of Appeals of the Federal Circuit reversed that decision. And it then went to the Supreme Court. Mayo filed one of these writ of certs again with the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court basically concluded that the patent claims at issue effectively claim the underlying laws of nature themselves. The claims are consequently invalid, and the Federal Circuit's judgment is reversed. And I always like that final. It's so definitive. It is so ordered. It sounds like the Wizard of Oz or something, you know? So August 16th, 2012, the Federal Circuit decision was issued. Um, and their decision was unchanged. So actually, remember, this, is, this decision is about the Mayo v. Prometheus, not about the gene patents. So this is what the Supreme Court wanted the Federal Circuit to take into account in reconsidering the AMP versus Myriad case. Because by this point, the USPTO had been released from the case. Um, they weren't going to change the Constitution over this case. So the USPTO got released. So the Federal Circuit reconsidered the case and basically decided to not change their decision. I don't know what that says to the Supreme Court, but they didn't change it. So then the Supreme Court heard the arguments April 15th, 2013, just of this year. And in June of this year, the Supreme Court issued their decision. And it was a very long decision. But they basically said that the genes and the information they encode are not patent eligible under this 101 product of nature uh, part of the patent law, simply because they have been isolated from the surrounding genetic material. So isolation of the genes from the rest of stuff doesn't make them patentable. Interestingly, what they did say was that man-made copies of gene transcripts or messenger RNAs, remember those cDNAs that I talked about, are patent eligible because they're made by man in a laboratory. So they said very specifically, they are patent eligible under 101. Now I argue that once you know the gene sequence, this message sequence and the cDNA sequence is obvious and anybody who knows molecular biology could know that. So, but that wasn't what was being argued in the Supreme Court. So amazingly, this was a unanimous decision of the Supreme Court. So unlike that Chakrabarty case, four, five, five to four, this was all eight judges joined, or eight judges joined and one concurred because he felt he didn't know enough to really mm, say whether they were patentable or not, but he decided to agree with the other eight judges. So gene patents, as of June 13th, 2013 were overturned. So the plaintiffs and the pathology community were absolutely thrilled. I don't know, you might have seen me on news and stuff, and I did a blog on the Fletcher Allen site, and I was, I was ecstatic. And I had just arrived not too long before that. And I wasn't so worried about the cDNAs, because you can actually, if you can use the gene sequence, then it's OK, because you can kind of what's called invent around the patents. You can not infringe the cDNA patents by just using the gene patents that aren't patentable. So medicine, we felt, could use the human genome for patient care. But then, Myriad, in July, brought a case against two laboratories that immediately decided that they were going to, going to start offering breast cancer testing, Ambry Genetics and Gene by Gene. So the injunction hearing was held in September, just this, you know, a, a week ago, September 11th and 12th in Utah. I provided a declaration for the 
two laboratories, as did almost everybody else who was a witness for the ACLU side of the Myriad case. So it's not finished yet. So this is sort of the timeline. There was one case that overturned all the patent claims that took you know, about a year, and then another year or so to uphold the gene patents, reverse the decision. Another case that continues to uphold the patents, and then finally the Supreme Court. So four years later, the patents were overturned, and now we're doing some more to see whether laboratories, so the hearing that happened in September was an injunction hearing, which means Myriad has brought the cases, and what they want the court to do is to stop the laboratories from doing any testing until the court case is decided. Then they can drag the court cases out for as long as they want. No one else can do the testing. Uh, that's my little commentary. Um, so basically, there are some philosophical questions. Are patent incentives needed for discovery or clinical impl implementation of, of genetic information? I would say that the, patented, the patents don't really incentivize clinical laboratories to develop tests that are medically very, very important. Should exclusive licensing of fundamental medical knowledge even be allowed? And is sole ownership of a disease in the best interest of the public health? So you might ask yourself, who owns your genes? And I would say that it probably uh, still is to be determined. So I'd be happy to take any questions, comments, uh, anything else. Um, it is not too difficult because there are test registries that say in the genetics community th there are certain places that you go to look for laboratories who are doing tests and they're public because we want to help as many patients as we can, genetic counselors, medical geneticists, other kinds of testing. So um, they could just go there and find all the laboratories and send the letters. It was pretty easy to find them. So how did they find me to do all those enforcement letters? Yeah. Do you mind if I ask you a broader question on the gene testing? Sure. I mean, I know. I don't mind. <laughs> Depends on the topic. I mean, uh, if you ask me about what car I drive. Or, you know, I'm, I'm a little know. bit leery to gene testing because, you know, people can react negatively to the knowledge that they have of potentially uh, terrible genes. And, you know, it may not afflict them for 30, 40 years. Who knows what the science is going to be by that? Meanwhile, they live their life in fear. I mean, you could have genetic testing of fetus. Oh my gosh, you know, this guy's this bad gene. You know, then they abort the fetus, you know, because of that potential. You know, there's a lot of negative ramifications of it. So I'm not sure, you know, the cat's out of the bag, but I'm not sure ultimately it's going to be a good thing for us. So you know, um, when we were working on the project to get the first draft sequence of the human genome, the Human Genome Project. It was funded out of NIH, and it was an international project to get the gene sequence. 5% of NHGRI's budget was dedicated to the ethical, legal, and social implications of having this information. We had it at the end of the project for kind of society, but not for individuals. But they were looking at what would it mean to be able to do this for individual patients. And what they found is it's a very, very personal choice. Some people are fearful. And so that's why many, and, and then other people want to know so they can prepare or they can make certain decisions. Um, so it actually is, is highly variable from person to person about how much information they want to know. Maybe they, and so there are actually studies going on. I'm participating in a study called ClinSeq, now going on at NHGRI, that enrolled people um, for cardiovascular disease risk. I'm one of the controls. I don't have cardiovascular disease. And, um, and they're sequencing the genomes of the patients now and of, of the people enrolled in this study. And some people want to know just the things that they could do something about. So when you talk about cardiovascular disease, you know, maybe antihypertensives could help you reduce your blood pressure so that you don't get all the side effects of that. 
But then there are other things that you might not be able to do anything about. And so they didn't want to know those things, but some people wanted to know everything. Like, I've had my genome sequenced, and I wanted to know everything about what I could learn in my genome. So it's, it's highly variable, and that's why with testing that's done and with the genomic medicine program that we're going to develop here, genetic counseling will be an extremely important part of this process so that patients can make individual choices about what they want to know. First of all, whether they want to have the testing done or not. And secondly, then, what information they would want to know in different categories and what they wouldn't want to know. And in fact, I had an experience at the University of Pennsylvania testing for spinocerebellar ataxia. The sister of someone who we had just diagnosed called and said, I'm doing renovations on my house, and I have to know whether I need to put in a ramp or not. So can I have my testing done? <laughs> and I said, well, you have to go through genetic counseling. And she said, I know perfectly well what the problems are with this disease. I don't need genetic counseling. And I said, sorry, we won't do the testing unless you go through genetic counseling. She was furious, hung up on me, but she called my genetic counselor and got genetic counseling. And afterwards, she decided to go ahead with the testing, but she said to me, she called me afterwards and apologized because she said, you know, it really was useful. I didn't understand a lot of things just from knowing my brother has this disease and can't move very well. So um, genetic counseling can be highly useful. And we have to decide as we move forward how much genetic counseling is needed. We're in a new territory now of being able to sequence a genome gives us a whole lot of information about people and their genetic risk of disease. There's also a lot in there that we don't know about. So I'm working on a national level of how you get laboratories working together so that it's not just the, the smaller population of Vermont, but we can actually compare our results with the national results in a bigger pool to better understand what we're seeing and what's medically useful and what we still need to know more about. That's a very long answer. I apologize. Um, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Sort of. Yeah. Um, I find it really upsetting that, um, I mean, to me, it seems like it's almost a bigger issue in terms of our society that it's okay policy wise by government, this, that, and the other thing. And I'm giving my own political point of view. Here. That's all right. I certainly gave mine. Um, <laughs> To allow companies to take, you know, genetic sequences or whatever and make fantastic amounts of money off it at the risk of people's health. You know, and I, I found it fairly telling that Europe and Canada wouldn't allow that. And they have a, a different attitude toward health insurance or, you know, health care for their people. I just, for this land of golden opportunity, yeah, it, yeah. Is, it is interesting. Our government tends to be pro-industry. Um, and us as a population tend to be very fearful of losing control over our health care. So if we look at Canada and Europe, they have basically socialized medical care. But here, when you talk about that, I mean, the Congress is still focused on overturning the ACA, the, the um, Obama Health Care Act. And when the concept of looking at the cost, the, the value of certain care, I mean, there was discussion of death panels and um, who's going to decide whether I get something or don't get something. So it's a, it's a very interesting societal issue. Um, and I don't know that there are real answers, but you can see I come down on the side of thinking that making money off of sick people is a bad thing. Drug companies, pharmaceutical companies have done that a lot, but their costs for development of a test, I mean of a, of a drug, are, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars in clinical trials and drug development, and their success rate is very low. It's a very different kind of market than the diagnostic market. So um, I basically agree with you, but it's, I, I don't have any good answers either. No, I, I, yeah. I guess I was making the comment yeah. that I'm just more and more qualified. So 
Oh, I see a question here and then up, up there. Uh, patents expire after 17 years. Uh, does that mean that uh, some of these tests are becoming available or will become available in the near future? Uh, so the availability, because patents aren't forever, um, right, it's about 17 years. I think it's 20 years from patent filing, but it can take a long time to get the patent to issue. Um, and so the Myriad, in fact, one of the things that the Myriad is arguing with the two laboratories that they brought the lawsuit against is that they only have about three to four more years on their patents and they want to get as much money out of it as they can. So yes, they, and, and their profits um, last quarter were $41 million. So I mean, they're, they're making a lot of money and it does have a big impact on their business model. Um, but I just don't think that healthcare should be such a business model. So yes, many of these will be coming off patent. And I think now that the USPTO won't be granting anymore, we can say that in 17 to 20 years, all of this will go away. But I don't know if you have a family member who has a particular disease and you want to know your risk and you can't afford the testing from the laboratory that's the only source of it. Do you want to wait 17 to 20 years to know the answer? So. I, I like that there's a definitive answer with the Supreme Court's decision that gene sequences aren't patentable. Um, Myriad is actually not, they're saying that they're infringing other, that these laboratories are infringing other claims in their patents that the ACLU didn't bring. So this case will be very interesting to see whether these other kinds of patents can be overturned through these cases. So I'll give you an update if you want. So I had a question up here and then over here. Did, did you have a question? Uh, that was, a, you, you really answered it. Okay. Okay. So with the most recent um, Supreme Court decision, all of the other patents outside of Myriad's patents, I mean, they all automatically fall to the wayside now and we have, does that open the gate for everything? Well, I, I was, I was quoted as saying that we now have freedom to operate in the genome, in the human genome. Um, I don't think, well, it, that's why I was so surprised when Myriad brought the lawsuit against the two laboratories who are actually using parts of the sequence of the genes that are not found in the cDNAs. So Myriad has these very convoluted arguments about why they should still be able to exclude other laboratories from doing this testing. And it will be interesting to see um, what happens. The injunction though, I mean it's kind of good and bad. The decision from the injunction hearing probably won't be out until November or December. So the laboratories at least until the injunction decision is um, uh, available can continue doing their testing. Um, and then we'll see if they if the judge wants them to stop or not. Because commercial commercial in vitro diagnostic test companies, so companies that were developing test kits that they would sell to many laboratories for doing this testing had to get a license because they were going to make a profit and then University of Michigan could get, get some of that. But Michigan did enough of its own molecular testing that it knew that you didn't make any money from it. So, you know, they were, <laughs> it was not a, a good approach for um, reaping some of the benefit from their uh, discovery. Well, it's interesting because um, some of the guidelines and recommendations from the policy studies that were done um, re related to research as well because a patent holder actually can stop people from doing research on their patented discovery, which originally thought was not to be true, but then there was a case in the courts that said that you that a patent holder could enforce against research. So um, I, I hope it doesn't, I, I, I think, I don't know. My prediction is that most of these gene patents are held by academic medical centers like this one because that is where you have 
patient care and research going on where the research can be informed by the patient care and vice versa. And most of us doing this research, while yes, we have to get grants and publish and teach and do clinical care um, in order to get promoted and keep our jobs, it's a little trivial point there. Um, so we have other incentives to do the research and the discoveries. Uh, one of the difficult situations is the level of NIH funding is very, very low at this point, and it's very hard to get grant funding to do this kind of research. But the fact that most of these patents are held by academic institutions where there are these other drivers other than making money, and you don't need the patent incentives to be able to, to motivate you to do this research, I think the research will continue. At least that's my hope also. So while I was at Penn, what was Penn sending out letters? I was very surprised because named on the Myriad suit, I didn't say who the plaintiffs are in this latest Myriad case. It's Myriad, University of Pennsylvania, and University of Utah. So I'm not at the University of Pennsylvania anymore, um, but I knew, do know a colleague who said, and I just saw him in Boston this past weekend at a meeting, and he said, um, that he and a group of faculty met with University of Utah leadership to say that they did not want their institution participating in this lawsuit. And they thought it was really wrong that that happened. And that's one of the issues. Technology transfer offices at academic institutions are the ones that did most of these egregious licensing, license uh, agreements. Um, so the, the academic institutions are not blameless. Well, thank you. Oh, one more question. One more question about how this all started. Because way in the beginning, you talked about being focused in terms of purely, you know, academic publisher care. Two really important things that you brought up were the Well, I think that the whole turning over of patents in general to academic institutions where they could benefit from the licensing and development of their faculty's discoveries was a very good thing because it did produce a lot of development. But then you drop into that this Chakrabarty case about being able to start patenting gene sequences, and that was kind of the glitch that made everything go awry. So I think a lot of the things that are discovered by faculty are, it's still a great thing that Bayh-Dole exists and that academic institutions can develop the discoveries of their faculty into useful products for the public. Um, so it's not just medical patents, it's all kinds of patents of universities. Um, but I think this one little glitch where the US Patent and Trademark Office started because of the Supreme Court decision, started granting gene patents. That was where we kind of took a, a left, if you will. Yeah. Did everybody hear that question? I mean, if I heard it down here, you probably heard it, right? So um, it's very interesting, because the pseudomonas that eats oil is not found in nature anywhere. So that is definitely not a product of nature. That is man-made, um, and it was invented by Chakrabarty, it and it's a very useful invention. Well, it might have been obvious, but no one at the time, in 1971, putting new genes into organisms was pretty darn new. That, that wasn't widely done. So it met all the requirements. But then you leapt from that where a new gene had been put into an organism that didn't have that gene. And it really was the organism that was being patented, not that gene. The USPTO made the transition to allowing the human gene patents. And there, the gene sequence once it's patented, that you can't invent around it because the only way to test that gene sequence is to use the gene sequence. And so 
I do think that patenting of the Pseudomonas organization, uh, or organism or um, strains of plants, I don't know, am I in farm country? I could get into real trouble here. Um, you know, things like that that don't exist in nature. I, so the thing with gene sequences is that they're simply isolated from nature. And in fact, that's what the patents say. They're isolated, purified forms and therefore patentable. That I don't agree with. Thank you for staying extra time. And if anybody has questions. <laughs>